All right. We've got two more games to get through here. Talk about our picks. Talk about some performances. Let's start with Chicago Red Stars versus Gotham FC. Let me just say it. Lynn Williams' show is the best ticket in town. If you get a chance to see it, get your tickets and go. 2-1, Gotham FC, winner winners in this one. Kind of looked like a tale of two halves, though, if, yeah. uh, if I'm being honest in, in this one. Lisa, I got to take it in person, uh, headed out to the village of Bridgeview and uh, took in a game at SeatGeek Stadium. And uh, I did. Part of, look, I'm not going to front here. I know where I'm from. <laughs> I let the people know where I'm from. But I wanted to go to this game to see Lynn Williams live and in action and in person. And, uh, yeah, she absolutely delivered uh, in this one. Kind of choppy, though. I'm not going to lie. There were straight. There were some phases of this game where uh, it just kind of looked, just there was like a stoppage. It felt like every 10 to 12 minutes. <laughs> At some time, I um, think maybe some yellows earlier in the game might have might have helped uh, help that out a little bit. We didn't see that, uh, but players are only going to play with you know how the game is going to them and how they're kind of going through things. But I think in that first half, you have a Gotham FC side that is absolutely taking advantage of the Red Stars, you know, lack of approach essentially in this first half of the game. So it took about 45 minutes for the Red Stars to kind of say, okay, we're in this game as well, because it took all but five minutes mm -hmm. for Gotham to get the goal scoring in this game. Jenna Neischwanger with the opening goal in this one. And I have witnesses in the press box. Uh, for people who don't know, that South goal in SeatGeek Stadium is very horrendous in terms of the angles of the sunlight and everything. And Taylor Smith, I said in mere seconds before, I was like, Alyssa Nair can't see a single thing. You yeah. should probably just whip in the ball and see what happens. And lo and behold, Taylor Smith whips this ball in. Jenna Neiswager continuing the run, gets the goal in, and now Chicago find themselves having to play from behind very, very early in this game. And uh, almost nearly got out of the half, but Lynn Williams – had other ideas of poor turn turnover, essentially. Shanae Farley was, delivers, and then 2-0 before the half. Yeah, first five minutes of the half and last five minutes of the half is when Gotham cap capitalized because that, that opening goal on the assist from Taylor Smith uh, to Jenna Knightswanger came in the opening five minutes, and then in the stoppage time at the end, Lynn Williams picks up the second goal for Gotham. Um, I, I want to take a step back, though, because – Starting lineups drop for this game, Sandra. And for Gotham, we finally get to see Jenna Nightsonger in the midfield. Yeah. <laughs> this is where this player has played in her career. Yay. We're I, got, I got so many. I got treated to so many great things in this game. <laughs> um, and this is a rookie for, for Jenna Nightsonger out of FSU that has played in a variety of different positions. And she is so good on both sides of the ball, with the ball, attacking, finding those seams, but also off the ball. Defensively, she's, she's a really good defender. And so when Gotham drafted her fourth overall in the NWSL draft this year, and we get to see her start in the back line for Gotham, that's where she makes her debut in the NWSL. She was a center back. She was an outside back and she played very well. She did a great job defensively. Um, she still was able to split lines with her passes and, and move the ball up the field, but that's not where she thrives. She's better in the midfield as an eight or a 10. Um, you can even throw her in as a six, but that's not likely going to happen. Um, that's where she plays. The fact that Nightswanger is a rookie and it is this Swiss Army knife for Gotham is so impressive. She gets her first start in the midfield for Juan Carlos Amaros and this Gotham side, and in the opening five minutes scores a goal. So I wonder if he's going to be thinking about that moving forward when, hey, we can use her across the back line, but if we put her higher up the field, she's going to be part of goal com contributions right to start this game. Um, but yeah, I think that when looking at kind of the first half to the second half, it is a bit of tale of two halves. And the Lynn Williams goal, tremendous, right? As soon as she receives the ball, it's it's Lynn Williams energy and, and magic that happens. But the goal only comes about on mistakes from Chicago, right? That's how it happens. They, they have a missed pass and they give it away. And in one pass, Gotham has gone from 
really two passes have gone from defending to having the ball in the midfield to giving the ball to Lynn Williams at the top of the 18. In three passes, that is what happened. Uh, the efficiency from Gotham was tremendous. And Williams receives the ball at the top of the box, and Tierna Davidson is defending her by giving her three yards of space at the top of the 18. You just can't do that against most players in this league, especially a Lynn Williams, because give her an inch and, and she'll take a yard, and before you know it, the ball's in the back of the net. So that was poor on my on on Chicago's part, right? Giving it away and then not immediately trying to win a bat, stepping to it. Tierna Davidson, yes, she was alone. She didn't have a lot of coverage, but um, you know Lynn Williams is fast, so you just have to defend her a, a little bit smarter in that type of position. And and then it's two nothing at half. Yeah, no, it was it was a good it was a good goal and uh, I think a good example of the trouble your team will be in. Mm-hmm. if your entire uh, midfield is gutted in an off season. So that's essentially what we're watching. I think week to week here uh, with, with Chicago, it was, we're talking about starting lineups. I, for me, I was also excited to get to see uh, Yula Bianchi get a start alongside Yuki Nagasato in the midfield. Curry Ricardo unavailable in this game um, was listed as questionable for this game with uh, I think that was listed as head uh, injury. But uh, when the lineups came out, for the starting 11 and the bench not even available on the bench. So I don't know how to go from questionable to just saying like not available at all, but that's what happened. Uh, and so we got to, I think when you have so many injuries uh, at this point, you are just sort of trying to put it together a starting 11. And that kind of, le- that kind of essentially paved the way I think to see Bianchi get a start uh, in the regular season alongside Nagasato. And, Look, it's evident uh, that there were midfielders who had never played together before, ever in their careers. And I think it showed in this game. I think that goal uh, in particular, that giveaway, yes, is, is on, uh, you know, the I think it was Malazzo with, with the errant pass. But um, the positioning at this point to just allow these uh, kind of turnovers to, to happen. I think it was, it's again, it was a very, like, if you ever want an example of like what it's going to look like, if you have a tough off season and how that's going to reflect in your regular season, I think you're looking at it week to week with Chicago. I think it's kind of easy to just sort of say, wow, look at these score lines. The defense is bad. And my counter argument to that is that there's not a lot, there's not a ton of that in, which it's entirely true. I mean, you have to look a little bit in terms of maybe tactics, personnel available. And I think I gave an example at halftime in terms of possessions that were one in the final third. It was two for Chicago compared to eight by Gotham. And for me, that's not necessarily a defender issue. That's kind of a, a bigger issue at hand here. I think when you're looking into what's going on on the fit on the field and then going into halftime and you're thinking, well, maybe if you get into halftime one zero, you make those adjustments. Um, and a little disappointing really to kind of hear in the post game, Petroselli said that they actually didn't speak about tactics at yeah. halftime. And that was a head scratcher for me as the media in the, in the post game. Um, but I think it was more an emphasis on the efforts out there. Uh, because I th- it just sort of looked like maybe they also got off to a slow start. So, so maybe it was just like, hey, we have to pick up the energy. Okay. That was my question. Yeah. Like, if you're not talking about tactics, what are you talking about? Question mark. More questions for for uh, for the, the franchise, I guess. I don't know. I think I can't help but, but think, like, you know, if we look at Racing Louisville, right, who are going in through similar stretches of not – picking up wins or getting those types of results. Now you've got a Chicago Red Stars team that not only got gutted in the midfield in the offseason, and now they also lost their their star striker in, in Mal Pugh. And you look at, like, uh, just today, uh, before we went live, Lisa, there's a bunch of MLS coaches that are getting sacked right now. And you're just kind of looking at them just like, man, you have to wonder if, like, the – if you're looking at Louisville and their record and their tactics, if you're looking at Chicago and their record and their tactics, if this is a different league, this is a different conversation. But uh, I think there's a lot of unknown variables there right now. I think for Chicago that are maybe that they're trying to work through essentially on the pitch. But I think having the players that you have, because there's a good chunk of them that are still veteran players can come out there into a second half and all of a sudden switch it and make it a game. And all of a sudden Gotham sort of was defending Chicago for nearly an entire 45 minutes for the second half. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, I think this, this Chicago side, they have a little bit of, they've had time, right. To figure this out, their ups and their downs. 
Um, and yes, it's not just like, okay, you, you let in two goals. Like it's so much more than that about, about coming together and, and ultimately getting a goal right in this game that they get one um, before the 55th minute from Ella Stevens, but there's still a lot of question marks about how they're going to consistently string together games um, with their three back with a four back, what's going to happen there tactically. Um, it's not just, Hey, rally, rally, let's go and get out there and get a win. I think good for Gotham in that they were able to sustain that essentially, you know, uh, I don't know if I have an Juan Carlos Alvaro's opinion quite yet. I don't think seeing uh, Gotham FC live and in person gave, still gave me more concrete answers around Amaros and his tactics and how he's trying to navigate that team move, moving forward. I just think Gotham did a good job of bringing in new pieces and good pieces for this team. And I think having the return of Ali Long is incredibly helpful for this team as well. And those are just good players who are, you know, ensuring that they're picking up the results where they need to get them, including this one on the road against Chicago. One more to close out this episode. We got to talk about Angel City versus Kansas City. And Lisa, I need to hear all about it from you because you were part of the local call in this one, and that's exciting. What yeah. what went wrong for Kansas City, in your opinion, in this game? Uh, this this one was tough. I mean, it ends up being a great game, three two at, at the end of it, five goals throughout this one. But it was three nil at halftime. Angel City got on the board, and and then there was no looking back from them. Um, this was a Kansas City team that was coming off of three straight wins under their new interim head coach, Caroline Quablum, and coming into this game, Angel City had been scoring goals but not winning across three regular season games they were winless yet they put in five goals so it, it was more a question of Angel City's defense at this point point. and again I mean I think if you're Angel City looking at this game yes you got three on the board but then you conceded two in the second half so there are still some pieces that are trying to come together on, on this Angel City side um, if you're a neutral and you're watching Angel City, you're just excited because you get to see Alyssa Thompson, the 18-year-old number one draft pick, just have baller game after baller game. And you usually see an exciting high-scoring match for these two. Um, looking at Kansas City and, and their game plan and their tactics coming out for this game, they had a high press on Angel City. They wanted to pick and choose their moments to press and put them – put. Angel City under pressure, and they did that. I think the opening 15 minutes of this game, that's really um, what Kansas City did so well against this Angel City side. But then as the minutes went on throughout this game, Angel City found a little bit more of their rhythm. I mean, the opening goal coming from Melissa Thompson was a no-look goal that had a double doink off the post. Like, it was the it was a golazo, an unbelievable goal, uh, one of, first of the kind that we have seen from this type of player. We've seen her score incredible goals, but this one, a no look goal. I feel like we could have started the episode with this game. field. I feel like I feel like we could have started the episode off with this game and just talk about Alyssa Thompson for forty five to fifty yeah. minutes on this episode just alone with this. Uh, the the presence of mind. The awareness at that moment to just say, I'm going to chip the keeper at a, the most ridiculous angle. She was facing upfield. That's, that's the thing. She cuts end line and then she it's, turns around and dribbles back uh, it, literally towards her own goal at, at the other 18 and then gets her hips around the ball, looks towards the sideline and chips yeah. it in. And you just watch Cassie Miller just sort of see this ball kind of rainbow over her and go off the post. And unfortunately the post doesn't always say the keeper. Sometimes it helps out the, the striker. And in this case, it's, uh, it's Alyssa Thompson, but it's incredible what we're witnessing, right. From, from this 18 year old high schooler at this point um, for, for angel city and in, in her rookie season, I think, look, there were a lot of questions around making the moves that they made to leap into the number one spot to try to collect uh, the, as many assets as possible. And Angel City spent a bit to make sure that they got there. And now they got Alyssa Thompson and it's looking, she's making them look like geniuses, yeah. you know, for going ahead and, and, and rolling the dice on a young player uh, making the leap to go pro and while a lot of the recap we talked about this being week six a lot of teams looking in front of them for this second quarter of the season 
you have to include Angel City, I think, in that conversation of teams who are looking to build on some of these performances coming off of a wild 3-3 draw, now a 3-2 win against Kansas City, a team that had a lot of momentum going in to Los Angeles and hanging on, essentially, for a win. It was a little nervy there to come out of the second half, to concede and allow Kansas City Current to get back into it and make a game of it. But uh, to kind of finally have a 90-minute game where they were able to put things together and look back and say, we did enough to get these three points. Let's make sure we keep keep doing that moving forward. Um, Alyssa I Thompson. That, yeah, I mean, Alyssa Thompson for sure offensively. But, but Angel City defensively, they just concede a lot of goals. They've got 12 goals against yeah. this year. And uh, although they're putting up 11 – it's still like if imagine if they could keep score lines to just one goal against them, how how much different games would be for them? Because, yes, they they end up getting all three goals uh, in this game in the first half, which is pretty impressive. So Thompson opens the scoring in the 31st minute and Claire Emsley gets one on a cross in the 43rd minute. And at this point, Kansas City is just like, OK, we've got a handful of minutes left, probably five minutes left in this game with plus little stoppage time. Let's just hold out. We can, we can go into the locker room at 2-0, um, have a conversation, talk about where the shaky parts are, what we can do better. And June Endo, in the final minute of stoppage time in the first half, just finds the back of the net for Angel City. And now Kansas City is, is digging themselves out of a 3-0 goal hole. And there's a lot of teams that probably would have put their heads down and said, this is just a little rough. We'll, we'll get back into it with one and then we'll go from there. But I think the mindset of this Kansas city side under Caroline Quablam is a little bit more. Um, it, it, they all, it's not as much of like, Hey, we can do this. We're, we're a blue collar team. We've got this. It's a little bit more like understanding of the game and understanding the tactics of what your opposition is giving you. And then what Kansas city has on the pitch and how they're able to do that. Because you look at the second half and CC Kaiser just occupying so different spaces than she was in the first half and, and finding those seams and getting on the ball. CC Kaiser is very impressive to watch for this Kansas city side but the way that the second half goes for Kansas City, they get back into it on, on Izzy Rodriguez in the 57th minute. Heck of a, a first NWSL goal for the young player because second year in the league, second year with Kansas City, and she has a rocket of a shot with her left foot from uh, the top of the 18-yard box, and it finds the back of the net. And then just a few minutes later, CeCe Kaiser gets the second goal for Kansas city, but, but that would be it um, on the efforts from Kansas city, not without a, a lot of trying though, because they were looking to get back into it and they made it seem very possible. That's what I mean. Like the games this weekend were really good and really exciting. Yeah. They were yeah, delightfully delicious for all the games. I mean, I, this was another game where I was just like really impressed with, with the rookie class. I mean, obviously we're talking a lot about, you know, Alyssa Thompson. And I mean, if we're talking about MVP chatter, why not talk about rookie of the year chatter Thompson? I think maybe the front runner in this, but again, I, I love, I love the performance and effort by Michelle Cooper uh, with, with Kansas city current. And I mean, we're looking at Robinson as well, having to slot into that back line for Kansas city has had another really good game. Um, but so, yeah, this was another one, I think outside of Orlando and, um, North Carolina, and now this game, we're, again, looking at the rookie classes and, and the players who are having an impact and a role in this one. And they will continue to do so because it's a long season. We're just in week six. We've got several more games to go. Uh, the standings have shifted. Congratulations to O.L. Reign in first place at the moment with 13 points. Portland Thorns bumped to number two with 12 points. Spirit, number three. Gotham FC at number four, San Diego Wave at number five, and Angel City have leapt up into sixth place for the playoff picture, the very early playoff picture, let's just say, in NWSL. Number seven, North Carolina Courage, Houston Dash fall to eighth, Kansas City current in ninth, Orlando Pride jump up to tenth, Racing Louisville at 11, and Chicago Red Stars hanging out in last place at number 12. We'll continue to keep an eye on the standings and we'll continue to be here for you.